I'm introducing to you introduction to food, nutrition and health as a module, one of the modules that are covered in nutrition. First of all, I would like us to understand the meaning of food and nutrition. What is food and what is nutrition? And how are the two connected to our health? Food is any material consisting essentially of protein, carbohydrates, and fats used in the body of an organism to sustain growth, repair, and vital processes and to furnish energy. Food provides the necessary nutrients, vitamins, and minerals to sustain our lives and to maintain good health. Without food, man cannot survive. It is food that provides us all the, the energy that we need and all the nutrients that we need to help our bodies to function well and to remain healthy. And what is nutrition? Nutrition is the study of how our bodies use the food we eat and how the nutrients in food affect our overall health and well-being. When we talk of nutrition, we talk about utilization of the nutrients in the food that we take. How are these nutrients utilized in the body? How the nutrients build the, the, the muscles? How the nutrients produce energy in our bodies? So that is the connection between food and nutrition. Food is anything that we take in that will help us to sustain our bodies and provide us with the nutrients. And nutrition is how the body uses this food and the nutrients in the food. When we eat well, when we have good nutrition, it helps us to prevent chronic diseases, for example, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and cancer. And it also improves our mental health and cognitive function. When we talk about a healthy diet, it should include a variety of food items from all the food groups. For example, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, and healthy fats. But as we consume all the food items, we have to be mindful to limit processed foods, added sugars, and trans and saturated fats, because these have a lot of empty calories, which do not provide any function in our bodies, apart from building up fat stores and causing ill health and oxidative stress. So once the food we eat is taken into our bodies, it goes through a process which is called digestion. What is food digestion? Food digestion is the process by which the body breaks down food into smaller molecules that can be absorbed and used for energy and growth. Take an example. If you boil a potato and you consume it, how does that potato become nutrient in the body. It starts from the mouth with the process of chewing. So food digestion occurs from the mouth until the end point when the food gets out the byproducts of the food that we have consumed are expelled from the body. In the mouth we have mechanical and chemical processes of food breakdown and essentially we have the saliva which contains an enzyme called amylase. This enzyme breaks down the carbohydrates that we take in the food. For example, if you have consumed a potato or a piece of cassava or kosho, the enzyme that is going to be released from the saliva is an amylase enzyme, which will break down the carbohydrates in that food item. Now, as you chew the food, and as the food is mixed with saliva, it forms a bolus or a soft ball that makes it easy to swallow the food. This bolus of food then travels down into the esophagus and into the stomach through a process called peristalsis. During this process, the muscles of the esophagus contract and relax in a coordinated manner to push the food forward. Once the food is pushed from the esophagus down to the stomach, it is mixed with stomach acids and enzymes that continue the breakdown further into smaller nutrients. This partially digested food, which is called chyme, then moves into the small intestine. And once in the small intestine, 
bile and pancreatic enzymes are released to further break down the food. The nutrients are then absorbed through the walls of the small intestine into the bloodstream. So that is the process through which food is taken into the body and becomes nutrients. And once all the nutrients are being absorbed from the food item you consumed, any of the undigested food and waste products move into the large intestine from where water and electrolytes are absorbed further. And then the remaining material is compacted and eliminated through the rectum and anus as feces. This entire process of food digestion can take several hours to several days, depending on the type of food you've taken in. And they, some people, maybe their enzymes are not being produced very well. And this is going to delay the process of digestion of food. Others have malfunctioned stomach walls that cannot produce enough of the stomach acids and enzymes to break down the food further. Others have problems with their mouth. So there are many challenges connected to food digestion. Once those barriers are removed, then the process of digestion will be, will be quicker and faster. So that is briefly how the food we take in is absorbed and taken down into the body and broken down into the nutrients that require. However, it is very important to understand the digestion of all the different nutrients taken into the body, from carbohydrates to proteins, to fats, to fiber, to minerals and vitamins. And this shall be looked further in the next lectures. Food values. What are food values? Food values refer to the nutrients and other beneficial compounds that are found in food. The ones I've been talking about, the carbohydrates, proteins, the fats, the vitamins, the minerals, and the fiber. Each of these food values play a unique role in maintaining good health and preventing disease. For example, carbohydrates provide energy for the body and they are found in foods, for example, fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes in different proportions. Uh, proteins are also very important for growth and repair of tissues and are found in meats, in fish, eggs and legumes. The protein we have both plant proteins and animal proteins and all these provide the nutrients in different proportions. And then also fats provide the energy and help with the absorption of fat soluble vitamins. And fats can be found in oils, nuts and avocados and all other food items, however in less quantities compared to the ones we've made already mentioned. Vitamins and minerals are essential for various bodily functions, for example immune system function, bone health and blood cell production. And fiber is important for maintaining health digestion and can also be found in fruits, vegetables and whole grains. It's always very important to have a balanced diet that includes a variety of foods from all the foods group in order to get all the necessary food values for a healthy diet. When you talk about food and nutrition and the recommended food items to be consumed and food intake, we shall talk about recommended food intake levels. And the recommended food intake varies based on different factors. For example, a person's age, the gender, the weight, the height, and the level of physical activity. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, the following are the recommended daily intake for the different food groups for adults. For example, the fruits. We're supposed to consume at least 1.52 cups of fruits a day. And the vegetables, you have to take in at least 2 to 3 cups, grains, 6 to 8 ounces, protein, 5.5 to 6.5 ounces, diary, 3 cups, oils, 6 to 8 teaspoons. The World Health Organization also recommends daily intakes for various micro macronutrients. For example, the carbohydrates. You should take in at least 55 to 75% of the total energy intake it should be coming from carbohydrates. And then the protein should contribute at least 10 to 15% of the total energy intake. The fats should contribute at least 20 to 35% of the total energy that you take in.
and the fiber should bring in at least 25 grams a day. And this is according to the order of energy production and essentiality. Carbohydrates should contribute the most energy and fiber or fats should contribute the least of the energy. So we have different terms that are used when you talk about recommended intakes or recommended food intakes. For example, one of them is recommended dietary allowances, RDAs. RDAs are the levels of intake of essential nutrients that are recommended for healthy people to maintain good health. How much of the essential nutrients do you take in to maintain good health? This is what we call RDA. And they are set according to different age groups. They are based on the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine. They vary according to age, gender, and life stage. For example, young children have different intake levels compared to adults and the elderly. And the person of 25 years requires different nutrients compared to someone of 50 years. A pregnant woman requires different levels of nutrients compared to a lady who is not pregnant. And a man will require different level of nutrients from a woman, depending on the level of physical activity and various other activities that are prominent in life. The second term we have is adequate index. These are similar to RDAs, but the only difference is that they are used when there is not enough scientific evidence to set an RDA. And they are based on observed or experimentally determined estimates of nutrient intake by healthy people. All of these recommended food intakes are based on healthy people. But when somebody is sick, the levels will vary, will be different compared to somebody who is healthy. And we also have tolerable upper intake levels. These are the highest level of daily nutrient intake that is likely to cause no risk of adverse health effects in almost all individuals. The highest recommended level of nutrients that somebody can take into their body that will not have adverse effects. Uh, in nutrition, we say that anything that is exaggerated will cause adverse effects, will cause toxicity in the body. If you're taking too much carbohydrate that will bring in a lot of energy and cause excess, this excess is going to be stored as fat. And this fat is going to cause you health problems. So any food item that you're taking in excess will become toxic, toxic in your body, including water. When you take too much water than the recommended, you're going to over dilute your intercellular fluids and electrolytes and cause them to function less. So that is where we talk about tolerable upper intake levels. What is the highest amount of a certain nutrient that you can take in that will not cause adverse effects in almost all individuals? So tolerable upper intake levels are used to help individuals avoid excessive intake of nutrients. We also have reference daily intakes. These are similar also to recommended dietary intakes or recommended dietary allowances. However, they are used specifically for food labeling purposes. They are the levels of intake of essential nutrients that are recommended for healthy people to maintain good health. We have also recommended energy intakes. These are recommended daily caloric intake for individuals to maintain a healthy weight and a good health. On top of maintaining a health, good health, we have to also maintain a healthy weight. Because we know that when somebody becomes extremely overweight, this is going to cause a lot of problems like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and many other challenges. So recommended energy intakes also vary based on the age, gender, and the level of physical activity. Acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges, AMDRs. These are the ranges of intake for macronutrients, such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, that are associated with reduced risk of chronic diseases while providing adequate intake of essential nutrients. It's a range of intake for macronutrients. 
and we talk of macronutrients, of course, what comes into mind is carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And these ranges are associated with reduced risk of chronic diseases, and they also provide adequate integral essential nutrients. It is always recommended to stay within the acceptable ranges so that you're able to maintain uh, good health, reduce the risk of chronic diseases, and also give yourself all the essential nutrients that you need. So these are the terms that are related to uh, food, recommended food inputs. We also have a concept of meal planning. Before you think of eating any food item, you have to plan on it. You have to plan on how you're going to prepare it before taking it into your body. For example, if you have a piece of cassava that you just picked from the garden, before you consume it, you're going to first wash it and then you peel. After peeling, you wash it again with clean water so that what you take in is not having germs. And uh, you can choose, of course, to either eat it raw or you, you cook it. So also the cooking process is part of meal planning. And once you have finished preparing it, getting it to the table and then getting it into your mouth, all those are the different processes that are involved in meal planning. How you get the food item raw until you get it into your mouth for consumption. So meal planning is the process of organizing and scheduling meals in advance to ensure that you have a balanced and healthy diet. It involves creating a list of meals and snacks for a certain period of time, usually for a week or a month, and then shopping for the necessary ingredients. Meal planning is very good because it can help you save time and money. It can help you to reduce food wastage and make it easier to stick to a healthy diet. Meal planning can take some time to get used to, but once you establish a routine, it can become an easy and efficient way to ensure that you are eating a healthy and balanced diet. It is a matter of behavior change because some people just are used to getting food ready and they just eat. For example, in the context of South Sudan, our men are used to just eating ready food. They just wait for the women to prepare. So that is the process of meal planning. It requires you to be ready for it. It requires you to be uh, ready physically, mentally, and emotionally too. What are the different steps towards proper meal planning? You have to first assess your needs. First of all, assessing needs involves determining your dietary goals. If, for example, you have any food allergies or restrictions, you have to put that in mind and then you make a schedule for your week. What are those food items you want to consume for the week or for the day? Assessing your needs. What is it that you need and why do you need this in particular? Remember, our goal is having a healthy and balanced diet. And then after assessing your needs, you have to make a list of the meals. Plan a variety of meals that include different food groups and that you also enjoy eating. You don't just get any food item. That is the beauty of nutrition. We, we, we just advise you to eat anything that you enjoy eating in recommended amounts to maintain good health in your body. As you make a list of your meals, you have to try to include a mixture of proteins, carbohydrates, and healthy fats in each meal. And then you have to create a grocery list. You have to make a list of the ingredients you need for your planned meals and snacks. After creating a grocery list, you go ahead to shop for your groceries. Go to the store and buy the ingredients you need for the week, or for the day, or for a month. And after you finish shopping, you have to prepare meals in advance. You can prepare the meals ahead of time by cooking or prepping the in ingredients so that they are ready to go when you need them. That process can, be, can involve cutting the onions, the tomatoes, yeah, and mixing the different ingredients, the curry powder and all that. You have to also be flexible. You have to keep in mind that plants may change and you have to have a backup plan in, in hand. So that when this plan changes, you have the second plan coming in. And all the steps move according to 
What are the key principles of meal planning? Balance. The first principle of meal planning is balance. Meal planning should help to ensure that a balance of different food groups and nutrients are included. For example, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals. A balanced diet can help to prevent chronic diseases and maintain overall health. Two, variety. Balance, then variety. Eating a variety of foods is very important for your optimal health because different foods provide different nutrients. Meal planning has to include a variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, and healthy fats. One, you have to have balance. You have to balance different food items and food groups. And then two, you have to have a variety of food items. And then after ensuring that you have variety, number three, you have to have moderation. Because we already said that anything taken in excess will cause harmful effects to your body. Eating too much or too little of certain foods can be harmful to our health. So meal planning should aim for moderation which means eating enough of the right foods without overindulging. If you're eating beef, do not exaggerate it. Don't eat too big portions. Just eat enough to maintain your proper function of your body. And number four, the nutritional needs. You have to take in mind the nutritional needs. When you're eating the food, what is your goal? You want to meet the specific nutritional needs of your body or for the individual for whom you're preparing the meal. If somebody is sick, you have to find out the dietary restrictions. Does this person have allergies? And what are their personal health goals? Do they want to lose weight? Do they want to add weight? Or do they want to maintain a healthy diet or a healthy weight? So you have to take all that into consideration. And then we also have timing. When you're planning a meal, you have to take into account when the meals and snacks will be consumed. If a food is going to be consumed on Wednesday, you cannot start preparing, you cannot prepare it on Monday because that will cause for more measures, for example, storage. And maybe it will get it will go bad before Wednesday reaches. If you're preparing a meal for supper, you have to start planning early. So that by, by evening time you're ready to prepare it. So eating at regular intervals throughout the day can help to maintain energy levels and also prevent overeating. And then uh, the next principle we have is adequate portion size. When you're consuming any kind of food, you have to ensure that an adequate portion size is maintained. And adequate portion sizes help to maintain a healthy weight and also prevent overeating. And then the budget and time constraints. We talked about the time already. You have to, to know when you're going to consume these meals. But also you have to put in mind the budget. A person who does not have a stable source of income is not going to exaggerate a meal plan. He's going to work according to what they have. So if you have 5,000 pounds to prepare a meal for the whole day, then you have to plan it accordingly. You have to plan for breakfast, you have to plan for lunch, and you also have to plan for supper. So, it should be done in a way that it fits within the budgets and the time constraints of the individual. 